Part Eight of Kamakura by Yone Noguchi. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Nichiren. Let me note down a brief history of Buddhism in Japan. As with the development of any other phase of civilization, what a vast difference between the civilizations, ancient and modern! We translated Buddhism most literally at the beginning, and then we saw the formation of Japanese Buddhism that is to say, Buddhism Japanized. It was in the reign of Kinmei, the twenty-ninth emperor, that Buddhism was first introduced from China. The prince Shotoku built the temple Tenwoji as early as 587 AD at present Osaka, Naniwa as it was then called. Buddhism soon became a great faith among the populace as the emperors led its course, all of them in the Nara dynasty, 708 to 769. We have enough of temples even today that will serve to explain what power this new religion attained. When Saijo and Kukai, two Buddhistic scholars, returned home from China at the beginning of the ninth century, they were officially commissioned to build the temples, the former at Eizan, northeast of the capital, Kyoto then, and the latter at the south end, where Toji, with famous pagoda stands today as of old. They can be properly called the founders of Japanese Buddhism, under whose power it took deep root in Japan. The number of the sects that had been already introduced then here were counted eight. After the death of the famous Kukai, we had no introduction of any new sect, but the religious fire was never extinguished. Emperor after emperor, noble after noble, built temples of their own faith, and beautified them with new altars, bronze idols, pagodas and bell towers. The age of religion and art was soon followed by the age of swords that lasted for some time. But when it subsided near the close of the twelfth century, the religious enthusiasm again took fire, but in a different form perhaps. The Zen or meditative school of Buddhism that was brought from China in the early part of the so-called Kamakura age, tacitly denied the pomp and formalism that belonged to the other sects. Its esoterism, or metaphysics, interested the minds of the ruling classes, but the populace found a more simple belief in the priest called Genku, who established the Jodo, or the Pure Land sect. His teaching was only to tell them that calling on Buddha's name in Namu Amida Butsu, I commit myself to thee, O Amidaba, was the assurance of their entering into paradise. The Shin sect, which might be called a branch of this Jodo sect, was started by Saint Shinran, who at once broke with the views or rules of chastity, and combined priesthood with the common joy of life. Its vulgarization, as one might say, made at once the approach of the people to religion easier, and again we had one more branch of the said Jodo sect in Jishu, which was more or less similar in observance with the sect from which it sprang. Now we have the three sects of Buddhism practically created by Japanese, and with the Zen school of the intelligent class, they, in fact, controlled religious Japan. But we found ourselves to have one more Japanese religion of Buddhism through a boy that was born to a fisher's family, in the village of Kominato, or Little Haven, in the Awa province, on a certain day of January of Tewa, that is, 1222. It is already remarkable to speak of the real founder of a new sect, and a Shudra of the sea coast, as he called himself in the same breath. His name is Nichiren, and his sect is called after it. There are, in fact, few stories more wonderful than Nichiren's, and it was mainly enacted here at Kamakura, the capital of his own age. I am happy to write down the most remarkable points of it. Whenever I happen to pass by Komachi Koji, the street that runs east parallel to Wakamiya Oji, the main thoroughfare leading to the Hachiman Shrine, I used to linger round the spot where the monumental stone for Nichiren's street preaching stands and imagine the undaunted spirit and extraordinary conviction of his religious career. Street preaching was a thing unheard of in the land in 1254, when Nichiren started it. I can hear at once in imagination 
the jibes and railings of the street audience. In fact, he was alone in the world with the Pandarika Sutra, in which he found the mysterious law of the white lotus. But his faith that, as a promulgator of the Sutra, he was Shakyamuni's special messenger, and as such Brahma served him on his right hand, and Sakra on his left, the sun guided him and the moon followed him, and all the deities of the land bent their heads and honoured him, made him unafraid of people's persecution. When he was accused that it was not proper for a man of his order to preach by the wayside, he said that it was quite proper for any man to eat standing in time of war. Indeed, he was in a field of battle with his religion. When he was rebuked that the other forms of worship could not all be mistaken, he at once shouted aloud, that the scaffold was of use only till the temple was done. He believed that he alone held the secret of the law, and was the only one messenger of heaven sent to save the world. He said somewhere, Know that the Jodo is away to hell, the Zen, the teaching of infernal hosts, the Shingon, a heresy to destroy the nation, and the Ritsu, an enemy of the land. These are not my words, but I found them in the Sutra, Hark to the cuckoo above the cloud, he knows the time and warns you to plant. Plant now, therefore, and do not repent when the harvest season comes. Now is the time for planting the Lotus Sutra, and I am the messenger sent by the worshipful for that end. Mr. Kanzo Uchimura says in his able essay on Nichiren, Most of his doctrines, I grant, cannot stand the test of present-day criticism. His polemics were inelegant, and his whole tone was insanoid. He certainly was an unbalanced character, too pointed in only one direction. But divest him of his intellectual errors, of his hereditary temperament, and of much that his time and surroundings marked upon him, and you have a soul sincere to its very core, the honestest of men, the bravest of Japanese. A hypocrite cannot keep his hypocrisy for twenty-five years and more, Neither can he have thousands of followers ready to lay down their lives for him. A false man? Found a religion? Carlyle exclaims. Why, a false man cannot build a brick house. I look around me and see five thousand temples manned by four thousand priests and eight thousand teachers and one million five hundred thousand to two million souls worshipping in them after the manner prescribed by this man and I am told to take all these as the work of a shameless mountebank. It is true that there was no man of religion like him who made himself a favourite mark of attack, and that attack soon began on him when he declared he was alone the saviour and holy messenger to humankind. After Buddha had spent many years on different sutras, he finally came to the Sadama Pandarika Sutra. For it he spent the last eight years of his life. It is quite a natural conclusion that his last sutra contained the essence of his teaching, and Nichiren found it to be the principle of all things, the truth of eternity, and the secret importance of Buddha's original state, and the virtue of his enlightenment. When Nichiren began to preach his doctrine and faith, he never excused anybody or any religious sect from his attack and again he was himself the very mark to be attacked. He was called a blasphemer and a sort of charlatan. In truth, he was a terror for all the priests at Kamakura in those days. When he published Risu and Kokuron, a treatise on bringing peace and righteousness to the country, he was obliged to leave the capital in the role of exile on account of disturbing the public peace. In the book he told the evils that the false doctrines brought to people and that the remedy could be gained only in the universal acceptance of the Pundarika Sutta and he even prophesied a civil war and foreign invasion. It is singular enough that we soon had a foreign invasion from the Mughals, although I do not believe that his prophecy was fulfilled as his followers are glad to say. This remarkable book, it is said, was written in a little cave in Matsubagatani, Dale of Pine Leaves, where he had a little straw hut, from which he went to Komachi Koji for street preaching. Today, 
a little temple called Ankokuji stands as his memorial, and the cave is the one that you see at the right beyond the gate. He resumed his religious battle when he returned to Kamakura from Izu, where he was banished. His vigour and audacity were almost out of his control when the authorities of the Hojo government decided to hand him over to the executioner. He was duly taken out to Tatsunokuchi to have his last moment. The whole affair is the most terrible event of the religious history of Japan, as it was the day when the law forbade capital punishment for the priest class. How he escaped from death is dramatically told in a popular book. When the executioner raised his sword to cut him down, he repeated the sacred words from the sutra, whose power brought down a sudden wind and thunder. The blade the executioner lifted was broken into two or three pieces, and his hands that held the sword were at once paralysed. And soon an official messenger from Kamakura reached the spot with a writ of release. He was to leave the capital again for a long exile in Sado, a faraway island in the Japan Sea. Of course, the place of death. Whoever goes to Enoshima, the holy isle of the goddess Benten, taking a car from Kamakura, has to leave the car at Katase. Near there, at the height on the right-hand side, one may see a somewhat prominent-looking temple called Ryukoji. That is the temple built in memory of Nichiren by his followers after his death, at the place where he sat repeating the sutra under the executioner's sword. He was never idle in his life of exile. He preached his faith wherever he went. By this time he was not religiously alone. On the contrary, the number of believers in his doctrine increased, and the authorities at Kamakura began to look upon him with fear as well as with admiration. And when his prophecy of the foreign invasion seemed to be realised in fact, its attitude wholly changed, and he was recalled to the capital in 1274, being given a charter for the free promulgation of his faith in the land. He finally conquered. Mr. Uchimura writes, he now began to think of retiring to a mountain after the manner of his Hindu master, there to end his days in quiet contemplation and instruction of his disciples. Herein, we believe, lies his greatness, and the main reason of the permanence of his sect. When the world began to receive him, he left it. Here was an opportunity for stumbling for souls smaller than his. He wisely retired into Mount Minabu, west of Fuji Mountain, under the silence of foliage and mist. But he died in 1282 at Ikegami, near Tokyo, where he went as a guest of one of his disciples. When an idol of Buddha was brought to his deathbed, he begged to move it away, and ordered a kakemono to be unrolled before him, with the name of the Sadama Bundarika Sutra written in Chinese. Then he turned his tired body aside. When he clasped his thin hands towards it, it was his last moment. As Mr. Uchimura declares, he was not an idolater, but a bibliolater in the real sense. End of part eight.